Let's come and read God's word together. In John chapter 4 and beginning to read at verse 27. Just then his disciples came back. They marvelled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not see? There are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labour. Others have laboured and you have entered into their labour. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Saviour of the world. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word today. Friends, we come to this passage continuing on from Jesus' encounter with this lady at the well. And this morning I want us particularly to focus on the central passage. God willing, we will actually come back next week to to look at the, the opening verses we have read here and the closing verses. But just now I want us to focus on this conversation between Jesus and his disciples concerning the work that God has given him to do. I don't know about you, but when I read these verses, I, I see the disciples seeking to understand what it is that Christ has come to do it it always seems to be a challenge to them sometimes a challenge with faith and don't we have that sometimes too trying to understand what it is that God's word actually means trying to understand how it applies to our lives how we put it into practice let's look at these verses this morning and see what we can learn from them. The disciples, of course, had gone into the town to buy food and have come back and they've found Jesus speaking to this woman at the well. They are obviously not aware of the conversation that has taken place. But they've returned. They had gone to buy food. We can only assume they have come back with food. They're probably eating it. And they're urging him. They're saying, Rabbi, eat. They're concerned for his welfare. And then Jesus makes this statement. He said, I have food to eat that you do not know about. They're puzzled. We can understand their their surprise at this statement. They're thinking, well, we didn't have any food. We went to buy the food. We've come by. What? How can Jesus say to us, I have food to eat that you do not know about? So (laughs) they're looking at one another and they're saying, has anyone brought him something to eat? Sometimes, friends, we're slow to understand that the word of God, recorded for us, indeed here, spoken by the Lord Jesus himself, is not always 
on the level of the physical and the material. He's speaking in terms of, of spiritual concepts, of spiritual realities. And indeed, that's precisely what Jesus is saying here. It's not a case that there was some secret source of, of physical food that, that Jesus was eating. He replies and said, my food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What is it that empowers Jesus? What it is that sustains him? This is how I understand the statement, my food is to do the will of him. The, that which we might say, which gets us up every morning. What's our reason? What's our purpose? And Jesus says, my food, that which empowers him, that which sustains him, is the very act of doing the will of him who sent me. He, of course, is referring to the Father. The work the Father has given him to do. Fulfilling the will of the Father. Think of those verses in Psalm 47. Psalm, sorry, Psalm 40 and verse 7. In those verses, clearly messianic verses, Jesus declares through David, Here I am, I have come, it is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Even here, the pre-incarnate Christ, a thousand years before he would come. Through the Holy Spirit, these words are given to David. And he says, I've come to do your will. Of course, we'll think about where that leads in a moment because in a very real sense the will of God for Jesus cannot be separated from the work which God had given to Jesus to do but as we think about this whole theme of doing the will of God what, what does it mean for you to do the will of God you know, friends, there's no end of books that are written about finding God's will. And I'm sure many of these books are helpful insofar as they direct people to the scriptures and to the word of God. I sometimes think that there are people and they're saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm seeking God's will for this. I'm seeking God's will for that. But how do they know what God's will is? Is it just a feeling? Is it just a sense? Is it just circumstances? That which we can be most sure of concerning God's will is that which he has shown us in his word that he would have us do. Think, for instance, of those who are not yet Christians. What is God's will for you if this morning or whenever you're listening to this message you you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, but you're seeking, perhaps you're searching, and, and you're wondering, well, what does God want me to do? What is God's will for me? It is to believe on the one he has sent, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour. The language that Jesus himself used in Matthew chapter 7, where he says, enter through the narrow gate, come into his kingdom. I love that story that Alistair Begg tells of, of sitting at a coffee shop one day. He was walking between his hotel and a conference centre where he was going to be speaking. And on his way, he had stopped at a coffee shop. He was sitting there. He was looking at his notes, looking at his Bible. And uh, the, the, the girl serving the coffee was from uh, perhaps Korea or, or China or wherever. And, and she noticed his Bible and, and she said, are you a Christian? And he said, yes, I am. Uh, and you? Yes, 
yes, I'm a, a Christian. And, and he says, well, where are you from? And we'll, we'll just go with the story that she was Chinese. She said, I'm, I'm from China. And he said, have, have, have you lived much of your life here? Or uh, I, No, she had only recently come from China. He said, so did you become a, a Christian in China? And of course, we know that in China, there is not the freedom of religion that we enjoy here. And she said, no, in China. He said, so please tell me, how did you become a Christian in China? And he said, with a rather puzzled look on her face, she said, I entered through the narrow door. This language from the scriptures, enter through the narrow gate. You see, friends, there are two paths in life. Wide is the gate, says Matthew 7, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But instead of continuing down that broad road, Jesus calls us to enter through the narrow gate and to believe that what he has done on the cross was done for us so that our sins can be forgiven. So friends, this morning, or whenever you're rehearing this, if you do not Christ not know Christ as Saviour, and you're wondering, what is God's will for my life? First and foremost, friends, believe in Christ. Put your trust in Christ. Turn from your own reliance upon yourself and instead trust in Christ for salvation and believe in him. But what of those who are Christians? What is God's will? What does God want us to do? Well, friends, instead of speaking about personal matters, and indeed there are times in personal matters where we seek to know what God would have us do, I cannot enter into those for you because they are personal. But let me tell you what applies to all of us. Matthew 5, chapter 6. Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before men. This is God's will for you. That they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Live your life as a witness and a testimony to the truth of God's word. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Again, this is God's will for us. And friends, that's hard. You know, I doubt that any of us here, certainly those of us who are living in Western Europe, have ever experienced real persecution. Oh, there's times when our, our testimony for Christ has made things difficult. But for most of us, our life as Christians has been relatively straightforward. There have been none who have really dared to make us afraid. It is not so all around the world. There are many places in our world where there is real persecution. There are those who set themselves up very much as the enemies of the Lord's people. And Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And then perhaps to, to sum up what I want to say to you concerning what it means for us to be doing the will of God. Think of these words from the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good and pleasing and perfect will. How are we able to test and approve what God's will is? By being transformed by the renewing of our minds. In a sense, friends, the moment a person is born again by the Spirit of God, their heart is renewed. Not speaking of that old organ, that old muscle in our heart, our bodies that pumps the blood around, no, but, but our very inner being is renewed. God has given us a new heart. But from that moment on, the work of the Holy Spirit begins to renew our minds. And this is not passive. This comes about as indeed we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Why do we do this? Paul says, in view of God's mercy toward us. And says this is our spiritual act of worship. What is the appropriate worship response from our hearts to the mercy of God? It is to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. To basically say, here I am, wholly available. As for me, I will serve the Lord. That God might use us. You know, friends, there are no doubt many other verses that I could turn to. To say to you today what God's will is. These are surely enough. And you can perhaps search for others. But the question is, are we doing his will? Are we applying ourselves to doing his will. Not saying that we will and not doing it. Of course, Jesus told that parable of, of the one son who said he would do his father's will and, and did no such thing. Or the other who had started off saying he wouldn't, but that came and did. And there may be some of us who know there is something that God has willed us to do, something that we should have been doing for him. And we haven't. He calls us to come, to do his will. So we are to put the past behind us. And the time is now to do what God would have us be. Perhaps there's an area in your life where you know you have not been obedient to God's call. Now is the time to come obediently and, and do his will. Your friends, we move on because Jesus did not only say he'd come to do the will of God, he had come to accomplish the work that God had given him to do. You know, we, we touched on that verse already in this message from Psalm 40. Here I am, I have come about me in the scroll, I desire to do your will. Even from his early, earliest days. Think of how Jesus, a 12-year-old boy, goes up to Jerusalem with his mother Mary and Joseph. They go to the temple. They're in Jerusalem. They're heading back. Heading back to Nazareth. I can't help but imagine the tension in the air when Joseph says to Mary, have you seen Jesus? I've not seen him. Perhaps almost that typical parent scenario. I, th I thought he was with you. Oh no, I, I thought he was with you. And when they realise that Jesus isn't there, they, they make their way back to Jerusalem and there they find him in the temple. And he's in a Discourse, he's in a conversation with the, the religious leaders. Twelve year old boy. 
And he's surprised at their concern. He says, did you not know that I should be about my father's business? Now, friends, we do not know how, how fully developed the Lord Jesus' consciousness of who he was and why he had come is at this point. But we know very clearly that he knows there in Jerusalem there is a work that God has given him to do. A ministry that would take him through the towns and villages of Palestine. And as it did so, he would be looking ahead to the cross, looming ever larger before him. And in his conversation and in his teaching. And see him in the Garden of Gethsemane. John chapter 17, verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth. By completing the work you gave me to do. You know, one of the last cries from the cross was, It is finished. The work that God the Father had given to Jesus the Son to do, it is finished. That word in, in the Greek that would be used for the completion of a great work. Or the final payment of a great debt. That same word spoken from the lips of Jesus. The work was finished. The price had been paid. What price? The ransom for men's souls. He paid the price of our sin. The Bible says... The wages of sin is death. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. What was Jesus' work? His work was to come and to give himself as the full payment for the sins of all his people on the cross. That work even heralded in the angels' words to Joseph, call him Jesus, he'll save his people from their sins. And he did. But I want to ask you, are you trusting in that finished work? Is your hope of being found right before God based on what Christ has done? Not what you have done, not what I have done, based upon Christ's finished work. It is finished. It is complete. The words of that great old hymn, I need no other argument, I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Is that your experience, friends? Is that your conviction? Can I ask, are we doing the work? The work that God has called us to? We'll think about that work. We'll think about what that work looks like. What about verse 35? You know, we see there that there's a great work to be done. Jesus begins to speak of, of the harvest. Verse 35. Do you not say that yet four months then comes harvest? Look, I tell you, lift your eyes and see. The fields are white for harvest. It's not another four months till the work begins. The work begins now. The work of going and making disciples. Jesus has said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. It's not whether we should be doing his work, but where. It's not all going to be on the mission field. It's not all going to be leaving everything we have here and going somewhere else. If God would call us to do that and lay that upon our hearts, then that is what we must do. But for many of us, it is to, to basically flourish where God has already planted us. To work for him. But to know that the work is there. 
but that work of witnessing, of sharing Christ, of making Christ known. Have we started that work? Or have we got sidetracked along the way? You know, some of us have been walking the Christian life for a long, long time. Only yesterday we laid to rest our dear sister Frida, 84 years of age, going to be with the Lord. You know, friends, she knew the Lord from her early teens. Likewise, our dear sister Elizabeth Roddy, again to whom we'll say our, our farewells this coming week, knew the Lord from her teens. It's a work that once we start on, it isn't finished till we're home. I love that new song I've been hearing a lot recently called Almost Home by Matt Papa. Don't drop a single anchor, we're almost home. Through every toil and danger, we're almost home. How many pilgrim saints have before us gone? No stopping now. We're almost home. We're called to press on in the work that God has given us. The need is great. The harvest is ready to be reaped. Why must we do this? Friends, because men are lost. Men are lost. There are those who would teach the lie of universalism. They say everyone's going to heaven. The Bible says not so. The Bible says only those whose trust is in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ are going to heaven. Others say, well, surely every religion religion has some truth in it, a sort of relativistic pluralism that says, it doesn't really matter what religion you follow as long as you're sincere. Not so. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Men are lost. They're in darkness. You know, some imagine that those who have not found Christ and have never heard of him or are living some peaceful, carefree existence. They're not. Anything we've learned, for, for instance, from Daniel and Elizabeth Moore of mission work in Papua New Guinea reminds us that the life of those who have never heard of Christ is a life of terror and fear. And what a difference Christ has made to those tribes that have not only heard the gospel, but have believed. We must go. Or we must at least pray and support those who God has called to go. Men are hurting. Physical, social needs. Do you know in the past 200 years, much of the work that has been done to help the needy not only in our land and around the world, has been done by Christians. Why? Because the love of Christ has compelled them. Friends, much of the compassionate, loving kindness that Christ showed was done not so much to demonstrate his power in the miraculous, but to simply show his compassion in the lives of those he met. Friends, surely Christ's love would compel us to go. You know, the day is not coming. It's not four months hence. It's here. The fields are ripe. And the sower and the reaper, we read in these verses, will be rejoicing. One sows and another reaps, that sower and reaper may rejoice together. And then says Jesus, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labour. Others have laboured, you have entered into their labour. Friends, sometimes we are doing the sowing. Or simply sharing the seed. You know, there are missionaries who have given their whole life to the sake of making Christ known among a people group and seen virtually no fruit for their labours. And then, and then 
the harvest has come. We do not get to choose whether we are sowers or reapers. We are simply to do the work that God has called us to do, to sow the good news, to tell others of Christ. Should God be pleased to grant us that glorious privilege of seeing perhaps through our testimony someone come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus? What a wonderful privilege that is. But ultimately it is God who will determine what becomes of that seed. We are simply called to be faithful. Sometimes we'll be sowing. Sometimes we'll be reaping. But we will seek to do all of it for the glory of God. Yes, that all men may declare his glory among the nations. The Lord Jesus came to do the will and the work of the Father as his disciples, as his brothers and sisters. Let us too be about that will and about that work by his grace and for his glory. Let's pray. Our gracious Father and our God, we thank you and we bless you. We bless you for the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that gospel which changes lives, which changes eternal destinies, Lord. We thank you that not only did your dear Son, the Lord Jesus, do your will and complete your work but he has called us and by the holy spirit empowered us to likewise do your will and the work that you have called us to so father here as we pray we ask for jesus sake amen and now friends what greater hymn to finish this service today than facing a task unfinished that calls us to our knees.